welcome to this week's little YouTube show. Um, thank you so much for getting this far. Um, I've been doing this for the last few weeks, basically since lockdown started. It's just a way of me being able to talk to people about things that I think are really awesome. They're really awesome. Um, something nice and good and interesting to pass the time in this kind of crazy world that we find ourselves in. Um, so thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, we've got a couple of great guests for you on the show today. Uh, first up, um, I should say we've got Rob Delaney coming up in a bit. He's brilliant. I'll tell you more about that shortly. But Glenn Ballard um, is an incredible man who started his world and his life in the music industry, working uh, with Quincy Jones. And since then, he's gone on to work with kind of everyone and anyone from writing Man in the Mirror to uh, co-writing and producing Jagged Little Pill with Alanis Morissette. I mean, you name it, he's done it. He wrote um, Hold On by Wilson Phillips. What a tune. Um, and we talk about that uh, as part of our conversation, which you can hear when it becomes a full episode of my podcast. Uh, but I thought I would share a little bit of a clip with Glenn today talking about this fantastic new series um, that he kind of came up with the idea for called The Eddie. And it is, yes, my boy. As I was saying, that was my seven-year-old asking for flashing lights for their disco party. Anyway, as I was saying, The Eddie is a brilliant new series that is on Netflix now, uh, executive produced by Damien Chazelle, and he's also directed a couple of the episodes, and it's set in the world of jazz. Now, if the word jazz puts you off, please don't let it, because this is a fantastic series set in Paris, um, and it's about a jazz musician from New York who has a club in Paris called The Eddie, and it's, I don't really want to tell you what it's about because it's its just a really great series. I think it's fantastically written um, and it's brilliantly executed and there's a big, music plays a big part of the series. But the really interesting thing is that it was almost like a flip of the norm of how this came about. Normally, you know, someone comes up with an idea, it gets written and people come on board to direct it and then they write music for it. It was the opposite way around with this, um, in that Glenn wrote a kind of handful of, of jazz, pieces of jazz music, basically, and had the idea um, of this club in, in Paris, and then Jack Thorne wrote it. So it's lovely that it had this kind of natural kind of um, birth from music, and that being the core of the... Uh, I guess the, the creativity behind it as well. So uh, Glenn is a lovely man, never met him before, but I thoroughly enjoyed chatting to him. And oh my God, I mean, there is so much we could have talked to him about with regards to music, but I've been loving the Eddie and it was great to chat to him uh, about that and kind of find out from him where the idea came from for him to start in the first place. Fantastic tonight. First time I've seen my clothes full. You always seem to get it right. Hey, bonsoir. On est fermé. Hey, 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 hey. I'm here for money. What's wrong with you? How much do we owe? Triple. Your club has debts. Your club has big problems. On a mis tout ce qu'on a. Tout, tout, tout ce qu'on a dedans. Dad, focus. Why don't you want to come home? New York isn't my home anymore. Yeah, but it's my home. For reading, I started some things here, and I can't just stop. How would you feel about playing the song that I wrote? Where are you going? Come down, come down. What is the problem? Nobody is having fun. I'm trying to understand what am I doing here. You are the one who's unprofessional. You don't care. You don't care. I don't need this right now, okay? I think I'm being fine. Farid's involved in something, and I'm worried that they might try and do something. You can't tell the police. No, I can't tell the police if they'll shut us down. You get inside now. On ne peut pas se de mauvais. I really love making music with you. There are people who are dependent on that club. This is all 
my God. You understand? This is it. Wish you something like that last night. Fuck you. How are you, sir? Oh, good. Thank you. Thanks for taking the time. Oh, are you kidding? I am absolutely loving the Eddie. What a series. Oh, I'm so glad you like it. It's so addictive. Um, I find that you kind of, you watch it and it just, it just entertains you so much. You feel so at ease with everyone, but then you just find that there's so much more unraveling as each episode, you know, is, is kind of presents itself to you. It's so brilliant. Congratulations. Well, we had a lot of really talented people to make that show. And I just so grateful to all of, you know, the great talent that, that, that wanted to be involved with something as unusual as our show, you know, the whole concept of, of jazz in, in 2020. For a lot of people, jazz is something, something nostalgic almost, you know? And so it was, a, it was a, I thought as an opportunity to just remind people that jazz is alive and mm -hmm. that it's, uh, that it can be very vibrant and that it can be about looking forward and not looking back, you know? So I'm glad that you're feeling it, you know? Well, I think that the whole, um, the story in itself about the, the kind of, the creation of the show is wonderful, you know? Uh, and the idea that, you know, you came up, well, tell me please about the kind of seed of this idea that you came up with quite a few years ago about this, this band and this, story about these characters in in Paris around the jazz scene where where did the idea come from within you it it comes from my love of great musicians i mean i I've, I've been fortunate enough to spend most of my life mostly in hollywood working with some of the greatest musicians in the world uh making records movies tv shows musical theater so the inspiration comes from from my brothers and sisters who can really play people who really know who first of all who've dedicated an entire lifetime to learning their instrument or to learning how to sing and then to, to go through the precarious journey of doing that to try to make a living from it it's one of the hardest things you can do so for me this is just a love letter to the people who who pursue jazz and who pers who would do it in in this day and age you would have to do it because you love it, because you're not gonna become famous. You probably won't make a lot of money from it. And so why would anybody do it? And so uh, I just wanted to offer the idea that you do it for the love of the music, you know? You do it because you sort of have to. And for me as a songwriter, this is, I've been doing this my entire life. I've been writing songs since I was a kid. This is all I know how to do. So for me, the idea of having a great band playing songs that I wrote is is a dream come true. And that's basically my whole life is trying to find people who will play my songs, you know? So <laughs> in this case, it was like jazz has sort of fallen by the wayside in terms of the mainstream, but it, it never for me did I, it, it ever go away from my sensibilities, even when I'm doing a lot of pop music or whatever. For me, it's about reminding people that first of all when people play music together there's something magic that can happen it's greater than the sum of its parts when it's right and when you and there's no better example of that than a, a small jazz ensemble because i i just think a lot of the young people have never actually been close to that and mm -hmm. for me the idea ultimately for this show was to to bring an audience into the circle of musicians who are making this kinds of music and to feel the energy that, that that's involved with that and to feel the magic. It's, it's, so if you haven't seen a great jazz ensemble close up, it's like seeing close up magic. It's like somebody who can do a car trip right under your nose and you have no idea how they did that. And when you see, when you see the Eddie play live, it's kind of like that. It's because I saw it happen. I mean, listen, I've been working on this, as an idea for about over 10 years, right? Wow. Um, because I, I mean, listen, I started my career as a songwriter and a producer working for none other than Quincy Jones, who is himself a jazz refugee. 
I mean, the first song that I really had recorded by a major artist was by a jazz artist, uh, uh, George Benson. And so I sort of got my start in a pop jazz way. And I've always wanted to find some way to use jazz in the current day and to, and to, and to not have it be something that you had to take a quiz to understand what jazz is. Do you, have you done your jazz homework? Do you know who the greats are? Mm. I mean, I know all of that, but it, none of that should matter when you're listening to new music. And so for me, this was about offering all new jazz songs, a brand new jazz band, and it's the current day. And so that was always the concept for me. I knew that if I wrote a bunch of new jazz songs, I would just drop them into the ocean and they would sink like a stone. So I always knew I needed a narrative and a story to go with it. So when I started writing these songs 13 years ago, actually, it was always about a jazz club in Paris in the current day. And that's as much of a story as I had, but every song was dedicated to that sort of high concept. So all the references in the lyrics I wrote are streets in Paris, the Guerre du Nord, where the Eurostar comes in, <laughs> which I've taken like probably 200 times from between <laughs> London and Paris. Yeah. It's my favorite trip, you know? So arriving in Paris at the Gare du Nord is like magic. So that's part of, of the subtext of the songwriting. But all these songs just existed as, as a concept of this band in Paris. And I, I just needed great partners to bring it to life. And boy, did I get lucky on that. Damien Giselle, Jack Thorne, Alan Poole, Udo Benamina. I mean, so the, the people who got attracted to this project got attracted to it because of the music. The music mm -hmm. already existed. I think we wrote 60, 60 new songs. Wow. And I had, I had 39 of them demoed, which I gave to Jack Thorne when he first got involved involved with the project and Jack sat down put on his headphones and he wrote eight episodes based on these 39 Eddie songs you know Whoa. so it's a very very unusual genesis for the whole project because we started with music you know and yeah it's usually the opposite and we also started with this concept that we wanted to show an audience real musicians playing real jazz music and not do a kind of phony you're faking it after the fact so Somehow we talked everybody into doing it that way. <laughs> all eight episodes and all the outlines, Jack has always talked about the rhythms of the show and it wanted to be a more of a jazz rhythm. So he would say, this scene should play longer than you would expect, or this scene should play faster than you should expect. But he always had rhythmic uh, sort of signposts in the script and, the, and in the narration. So <clears throat> really I had the greatest partners possible to take something like this to, and bring it to life. I mean, Damien shot his on 16 millimeter film. So we were doing live music on set, wow. on film. Wow. And the, no one in, in any of the crew had ever done anything like this because you'd never do TV this way. You know, mm -hmm. you would never do live music on television. You don't do it in movies either. You just don't do it because it's too hard, you know? But we unless, you're Dame, unless you're Damien Chazelle. I mean, Whiplash was like, oh! Unless we've talked, unless we've talked uh, Netflix into doing it this way, which <laughs> they, were, they were absolutely so wonderful in accommodating just the concept, you know, of like, this is the only way we can really authentically present what, what a jazz band in Paris would be right now. This is the way we have to do it. And they went, you know what? You're right. <laughs> wish you something like that last night. Thank you. Glenn, it's so lovely to chat to you. Uh, I look forward to the day when maybe, you know, the Eddie's in Paris ready to play a live show. I can come and we can pick up and do chapter two uh, of chatting face to face about your wonderful career. That would be lovely. And I look forward to seeing you in London. Thank you, Glenn. You take care, sir. Be safe. Glenn Ballard talking about The Eddie, which you can see on Netflix now. It is well worth it. It's brilliant. And um, it's just really stylish. It's really fun. The characters are brilliantly written and there's loads of great music in it. So please do go and check it out. Also, loads of great music in Echo in the Canyon. We had uh, Jacob Dylan and uh, Andrew, the director of this brilliant documentary called Echo in the Canyon, which looks at 
very sort of small period in the 60s um, in this whole burst of influence that came from the whole Laurel Canyon area of California and how it was really the birth of this whole scene. Um, so we had the, a little snippet of these guys on the uh, of Andrew and Jacob on the on this show last week and they are in their full bloom with loads of music on this week's podcast soundtracking with Edith Bowman so if you search in your you know head to your local podcast provider you can uh, find us there we are soundtracking with Edith Bowman and you can hear Jacob and Andrew talk in detail and at length about working on this show uh, and putting it together and giving all the contributors everyone from Michelle Phillips to Eric Clapton to um uh, Tom Petty, it was one of the final interviews that Tom Petty uh, did as well. So there's some brilliant, brilliant stuff in there. So listen to the podcast and also go and check out the film, which is available now to stream. Right then, uh, my uh, final guest for this week's show is Rob Delaney, who is a bit of a polymath, kind of does everything. Uh, I've seen him do stand up. I love Catastrophe. He pops up in loads of films, be it Bombshell, Deadpool. Uh, amongst many other things and I reached out to him on Twitter and asked him if I could I'd encourage him to come and do the podcast he said yes however we had a lovely zoom rendezvous it was great 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 fun great chats and then the next morning I went to start editing it and couldn't find it on my computer so I was mortified I had to uh, go to him and ask if he could do it again he said yes so we had another zoom chat which was brilliant and he's just really honest and honest with a kind of really there's kind of comedy that comes with his his honesty and and that's it's brilliant he's such a unique character but I really loved chatting to him and again we're going to make a full podcast episode out of our chat and we talked about so much stuff you know all his film work catastrophe working with Sharon who's been on the podcast before as well been in the new Home Alone film. Oh yeah. Uh, the music that he loves listening to, whether he listens to music when he writes. And we also talked about Devs, which is uh, a show that he absolutely loved. If you've watched this show, you'll have heard Jeff Barrow on here talking about the writing score for that with Ben Salisbury and the Insects. Um, and you'll know that I absolutely love the show. I'm hoping to get to chat to Alex Garland about it at some point. Um, but he loved, you can watch it, by the way, on iPlayer. It's up there still for you to do. And you definitely should. You should also listen to the soundtrack, which is available to stream and to buy in a kind of, you know, vinyl or whatever from Invader Records. But um, one of the things that um, I think Rob really took from the show and was really impressed by was the way that the main character was written in regards to how he was dealing with or not dealing with the loss of his daughter. And obviously Rob could relate to that, having lost his son, Henry, um, which he's been very honest about and has talked about in, in you know, in great detail. Uh, and I think that's been something that's one, another thing that's wonderful about him because that, I think, in itself has helped so many other parents who have had to go through grief. And I can't begin to imagine how that feels. Um, but it was... I think it's a, a brilliant thing that he's done, that he's talked about it. And I think with Devs, he, he was really impressed by the way that that character was written. Uh, and so I I was quite nervous about going there and talking to him about, you know, his experiences with, with grief and, and losing a young child. But I wanted to find out from him um, whether or not it was something he felt that he could express creatively. So here is the wonderful, brilliant and honest Rob Delaney. Have you thought about um, using that experience to to write about it in a way that feels, re you know, you, you talk about how you, you really thought this was a great way of, of someone who'd gone through grief, how it was depicted. Is that something you've thought about doing is, is writing through your experiences and your emotion of someone going through, who's gone through grief um so extent. not directly yet that could happen um but i've been doing it more obliquely um for example we wrote the end of catastrophe quite soon after henry died and um you know i 
can't believe that I wrote a whole series of TV uh, with Sharon Horgan so soon after that. But I, I kind of wanted to show my kids uh, that their that life would continue for them. So I sort of like modeled what I thought I should do. Like, oh, they should see their dad go to work so that they go to school, you know, mm -hmm. and stuff like that. So, um, so I did, and I didn't know what that experience would be like. I quite enjoyed writing the fourth series, Catastrophe. However, at the end, um, that definitely was me weaving some of my grief into uh, scripts and into a show because, you know, the ending of, of Catastrophe is um, somewhat of a curveball, not necessarily a curveball, but you're left with some serious questions. And so I, you know, very consciously wanted to uh, hurt people, not in a way that they wouldn't recover from, but I wanted people to feel pain and sadness and confusion and love um, at the end of Catastrophe. So that, that was, yeah, that, that couldn't, that it wouldn't have, Catastrophe wouldn't have ended that way if Henry hadn't died, certainly. Yeah, and what, how, how significant was that track then to that specific whole process, sorry, that whole process, you know, that arcade fire track? Well, it's very funny because, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm big on, on the writing 101 um, guideline of show, don't tell. Mm -hmm. um, but the lyrics to that track are, are really telling you uh, what's happened. I mean, it's, it's, it's basically like a, you know, a final statement um, uh, about the characters of Rob and Sharon. So, um, so they're critical. We literally took out some things that we wrote uh, Sharon and Rob saying, because we were like, oh, well, let's just let Arcade Fire sing it. You know, <laughs> I think people would rather hear them sing it than us say it. So we'll just, you know, go for a swim while it's playing, and and that was just what we did. You know. Do you write with music? Do you write? Do you have music on when you're writing? Sometimes, um, if I'm writing by myself, sure. Um, but not. Yeah, I guess now I do. I've become one of those people. I don't think this is good but I'm one of those people who listens to music all the time. Mm -hmm. And the reason I say I don't think that's good is because I think silence is good for your imagination. So I really should, like even today I went for a run um, and I was like, why don't I just leave my headphones behind? You know, I just think, and I was like, no, I'd rather listen to some frog stoner rock <laughs> uh, while I run along the river. <laughs> and that's what I did. Thank you so much for your time. Um, it's really great to chat My to you pleasure. again. Um, and yeah, great stay safe and you. lovely to see you. you Thanks too. so much, Rob. Take Thanks care. So Bye, love. Right. Thank you. Oh man, he would definitely be, he's definitely on my kind of, you know, having a big old one of those fantasy dinner parties. Rob Delaney would be on that in, in a flash. Thanks to Rob for being so honest and taking the time twice to talk to me. Also to Glenn as well. Please do go and check out this week's podcast. As I said, it's on your whatever podcast provider you listen to, head for Soundtracking with Edith Bowman to hear Jacob and um, Andrew. And in fact, I think it's our 200th episode. So there's a few others there that you can dive into, uh, including Sharon Horgan, which is great. She was awesome. Uh, I'll be back next week with John Apatow, actually talking about his new film, The King of Staten Island. And also Simon Bird, who you'll know from In Between Us, who's made a film, directed a film. It's called... Um, Days of the Bagnold Summer, and it's great. And he's only gone and got Bell and Sebastian to do the score for it. So next week, I'll have a little clip of when I chatted to Simon and Stuart from Bell and Sebastian at the Glasgow Film Festival. Um, the film is actually going to be available on Monday, which is the 8th of June. So maybe in the meantime, you can go and check out the film, Days of the Bagnold Summer. And then you can hear them talk about it on next week's show. Um, right, thank you so much for watching and listening to me witter on. I hope you've found some of it entertaining. If you have, then you can maybe subscribe. The button is somewhere. Uh, leave a comment, tell your friends, spread the word. You know, that's 
how we rely on getting this out there. Um, and I'll be back next week. Thank you so much for watching. Take care of yourselves, be safe and loads of love. Bye-bye.